on that. Matthew chapter 5, and uh, we, I did bring the fish home, and so I froze it and brought it in the, the luggage, and they got it back home. The Bible says, And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and that when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them. And boy, whenever he opened his mouth, it would have been a good time to listen. And uh, no talk and saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Thank you, Father, for your word, the spoken word. And Father, we want to be like your disciples that when you speak, we listen. And uh, we allow the word of God to do what it does so well. And it grows us, it builds us, edifies, it reveals the areas of our life that need uh, pruning and purging. And it's such a wonderful, wonderful book, a life manual, Father. And so I pray you bless uh, the few moments that we have together looking at the recipe, uh, Lord, to a happy life. And Lord, that's our desire. We want to live happy. And if we're not happy, how in the world are we going to help others to find the happiness that you have available for them? Uh, Lord, we're the greatest advertisement that we can give of what you've done in our lives as we share that story with others. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you, be seated. Let me just take a few moments. We'll review from last week. Uh, we see here in Matthew chapter 5, <clears throat> chapter 6, and chapter 7, uh, one of the early uh, messages or truths that are recorded that Jesus taught, uh, referred to as a Sermon on the Mount. And uh, the Sermon on the Mount sort of has a, pre a preface or a beginning part and uh, that's referenced as the Beatitudes. Uh, the word Beatitude means divinely happy, supremely blessed, happiness that comes from the divine, and to be envied. And uh, boy, isn't that something the world would have us to envy what they have. The devil would want us to covet and envy what they have. And God said, I want you to understand, uh, I want the world to envy what you've got. And uh, money can't buy what we have. And uh, popularity and prestige and position can't buy what we have. And uh, we ought to have a life that uh, is very obvious in regards to happiness on the outside. And so Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, <clears throat> this portion at least called the Beatitudes, are, is uh, God's instructions on how to be happy. God's instructions on how to be happy. There's a lot of how-to books in the Bible. You can go to online and Amazon and Barnes and & Noble, a lot of different bookstores, and to try to find books of how to be happy. And you'll find all kinds of, of ideas and directions to go, but God tells us here in Matthew chapter 5 uh, some things that are needful, uh, instructions that, are, that need to be applied for us to be happy. The Beatitudes are the way to the happiest kind of life. And so as we look at this uh, passage of Scripture these next couple of weeks, several weeks, we see the words that start off, blessed are, blessed are. Uh, the blessed are is in the present tense. Uh, God wants us to be happy, not someday when we get to heaven, uh, not in the past, long years ago, but God says, I want you to be happy right now. And I want the, the happiness of God uh, to be um, very obvious in our lives. And so Jesus then uses these Beatitudes to describe this God-given happiness uh, that's completely independent of the circumstances of our lives. Because most of our happiness is circumstantial. If things are happening good, then we're happy. If things are not happening the way we would like them to go, circumstances are not going the way we would like, then we're not happy. Uh, but that's not what true happiness is. True happiness is not tied to the circumstances of life. It's independent of those circumstances, unrelated. You see, here's the problem. When I, when I fail to disconnect happiness from circumstances, then I begin to put my focus on the wrong source of happiness. I begin to put my source on everything going right in my life. And what is everything going right in my life? How do we even define that? Uh, even things that we thought was right, uh, when it finally happens, it doesn't bring happiness like we thought it would. Uh, would. And so uh, we see then that we've got to make sure the source of our happiness is God. And we don't want to be disconnected from the source of true happiness and uh, thereby becoming a slave to a counterfeit happiness. God, we mentioned last week, wants us to be happy. God desires for us to be happy. There's no greater testimony. I preached this morning on the power of your testimony and how it's a weapon that we use against the adversary, the devil, to defeat him and destroy him uh, as we look at the word of our testimony uh, in the revelation we saw this morning. But uh, a happy life is a wonderful testimony. Uh, there's plenty of reasons that we can be unhappy. There's plenty of reasons that we can have a long, uh, solemn face and somber and, and a gloom and doom and woe is me and life's 
falling apart. There's all kinds of reasons for that. Uh, but what a way it is to testify the greatness of God when we can be happy in spite of what's going on in our lives. What's going on wrong in our lives? Uh, we see in Psalm 144, 15, we saw last week, happy is that people that is in such a case, yea, happy is that people whose God is the Lord. So happiness, true happiness, uh, is not based upon, we often have often used this, this, this term uh, where happiness and joy are different. Happiness is based upon what's happening in your life. Joy is based on God and your relationship with God. And though I believe that's true, I do also believe that God wants us not just to be joy-filled. God also, because he says, happy are my people. And so true happiness is not tied to circumstances. The world's happiness is. It's tied to what's going on in your life, what's happening, but God's is not. It's as happy as that people whose God is the Lord. And the Bible also says blessed is a nation, uh, as well as we can be a happy nation uh, as, uh, as the place of God in our lives. And so God wants us, to be, wants us to be happy, and he wants to bless us with happiness, not produced uh, or affected by our emotions or changing circumstances in our life. He wants us to enjoy real happiness. And so the Beatitude give us those keys those keys of what God says need to be a part of our lives if we're to have true happiness and so the Beatitudes teach us how we can arrive at a place of true happiness uh, sadly most people think that happiness comes from possessions from positive circumstance in your life through relationships uh, but the Bible teaches that true happiness is always divine it's not something that you find it's something that God gives to you it's a blessing from God that's what the Bible says blessed is man so when you see that word blessed uh, the blessings of God is happiness and uh, well there's no greater blessing than to have a happy life and it doesn't mean everything's going the way I want it to go, but I can enjoy and have a happy, uh, joyful life. That's God's desire for all of us. And so as we look then at this, happiness ultimately comes as a result of being blessed from God. And so the word blessed is, is more, though, than just happiness. It also means approved. Uh, when a, a young man seeks uh, the blessing of uh, a future father-in-law, uh, he goes to get the blessing. Uh, what's he looking for? Excuse me, what's he looking for? <clears throat> He's looking for the approval of that father to be able to marry his daughter, their blessing and uh, their approval. And so uh, uh, those of us that uh, uh, begin to implement the, the, fruit, the, um, uh, the, the, the uh, Beatitudes uh, in our lives, uh, we begin to realize that brings God's approval. That makes God happy. And when we live a life that pleases God, then sort of like the old statement go, when mama's happy, when mom's happy, everybody's happy and when God's happy for a Christian if I'm living a life that makes God happy it's approved of God then I'll tell you what you're gonna live a happy life the most unhappy people are those that are not living their life to bring pleasure to God they're not living their life to bring approval to God where God says well done thou faithful and good servant approved of God and blessed of God and that God desires so when God's happy I'm happy. And so God gives us now in these next several verses, beginning in verse number three down, uh, what we need to do or implement in our lives so that we can make God approved of us, so that God can be happy. And therefore, when God's happy, I'll be happy. Here's the first quality of true happiness in verse number three. Blessed are. So again, that's happy are, present tense, not one day you'll be this way, but right now you are. Blessed are. And here's the, 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 the um, phrase that we're looking at, the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, in the world's eyes, this would seem like a paradox. How can the poor be blessed? How can the poor be happy? I mean, that's certainly not what the world says is going to bring happiness. Poverty, uh, wealth and riches and materialistic and uh, things and stuff uh, is what the world says. But God's wisdom uh, is not of this world. And that God's ways are not this world. And so if I'm listening to what the world says will bring happiness, I'll always be disappointed. Uh, it doesn't mean that there won't be some um, uh, sort of happiness uh, that'll be very superficial. It'll be very temporary, but it won't be real happiness. And so sin will always bring pleasure, happiness, 
for a season. It's a very short season as it satisfies the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the lust of the, 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 the pride of life. It'll be short-lived. But true happiness only comes from God. And so God says in his wisdom that the poor, uh, as we become poor, not, not necessarily monetarily uh, in this sense, but poor in spirit, then the stronger God's power will be manifest in our life and the sooner we'll begin to enjoy true happiness. So God says your happiness is tied to your poorness of spirit. So it would be wise, we better find out what does it mean to be poor in spirit? What does that mean to have a poverty of, of spirit? Because God says these are the ingredients, the instructions for me to have true happiness. And so the first one is very archaic to us. Uh, what in the world does that mean? As long as a person is not poor in spirit, that person is not capable of ever enjoying true happiness. Everything will be a substitute. Everything will be artificial. Everything will be a counterfeit. Everything will be very superficial on the surface. You'll never be able to enjoy true happiness uh, until you understand and begin to apply what the Bible says about being poor in spirit because this is the foundation of what happiness is all about. And so it doesn't read, blessed are those who were poor in spirit. Uh, it says, blessed are, present tense, those are what? Poor in spirit. So this is an ongoing thing that if I'm to enjoy the happiness of God, true happiness has available for us, then these are things that we must implement in our life on a day by day, moment by moment, hour by hour, week by week, month by month. It ought to be an active part of our life if we're going to truly enjoy what God says about this thing called happiness. And it's a, we need to continually remain uh, in this uh, spirit of poorness of spirit. And so we must continue to recognize uh, the need for this. And so a day by day thing. So to be poor Poor in spirit means a complete absence of pride, self-assurance, and self-reliance. Uh, by nature, we're very independent. By nature, we're very self-focused. By nature, we're very self-sufficient, at least we think we are. And if that's our mindset, then we'll never, ever be able to be blessed with true happiness. Again, happiness is not found. Happiness is received as a blessing of God by us applying the principles of God's instructions uh, to our lives. And so when we see this thing poor in spirit, it means a consciousness that we are nothing in the presence of God. The poor of spirit recognizes that we are nothing in the presence of God. Those who are poor in spirit realize how insignificant we are in the presence of, of the Lord God Almighty. Isaiah understood this. In Isaiah chapter 57. Let's turn there, if you would please, Isaiah 57 and verse number 15. So if I'm going to enjoy true happiness, then I've got to implement these instructions. The first one is poor in spirit. Poor in spirit uh, is where I recognize how unimportant, insignificant, uh, how I am uh, nothing uh, in the presence of the Lord God Almighty. We see in Isaiah 50, 57, verse number 15, the Bible says, For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity. Boy, that's a good way to look at God. The high and lofty one. Uh, he's greater than we would ever imagine that we could ever be. He's obtained much more than we could ever obtain. Then it says, Whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. And so God is giving to us through Isaiah uh, sort of a summary of what the poor in spirit is. God says that contrite, that humble spirit uh, is, uh, is there. Uh, why? Because you're in the presence of the high and lofty one. And uh, when you become proud, uh, it shows that you've not been spending much time in the presence of the high and lofty one. Uh, when you think that you're a little bit better than everybody else, uh, it begins to recognize that you're not hanging out with God. Because when you're with God and you're in the presence of God, it leaves us with a broken or a humble and a contrite spirit. It leaves us with being poor in spirit, realizing how insignificant unimportant than I am. I'm nothing. I'm nobody in the presence of God. As long as I think I'm somebody, then I forfeit my right to ever enjoy what true happiness is. And so God says, here's where true happiness is. It's realizing how insignificant, how unimportant, how nothing you are. And the more I read, now you say, well, how in the world does that bring about, we'll see tonight, bring about happiness. Uh, so the poor in spirit, uh, to be poor in spirit is to realize how much greater 
God is. You see, the greater I realize God is, the more poor in spirit I'm becoming. And, and so the, I, I, I recognize that God is the high and the lofty one. God is the, the almighty one. God is the, uh, beyond my understanding God, the all, all uh, encompassing God of, of, uh, of our uh, omnipotent God and omniscient God and omnipresent God, all the very attributes of God. And so the greater God is, the more I'm going to be humble in spirit, contrite in spirit, or as the Bible says in Matthew, poor in spirit. To be poor in spirit is to see ourselves as we truly are in comparison to God. Small, weak, sin-stained, guilty, imperfect, uh, carnal, uh, you name it, that's where we are in the presence of God. And so to be poor in spirit is to stand without pretense before God, stripped of all self-sufficiency, of all self-security, of all self-righteousness. You see, there's no place in the presence of God of pride and a haughty spirit and being puffed up. And that's why the closest way that you'll ever get to God is that humble spirit because you see how big God is. And when you get close to God, you get to spend time with God. You get to know God. And then you become happy. Why? Because you make God happy. You were created to fellowship with God. And when you draw closer to God, that pleases God. That approves of God. And that makes God happy. Thereby, we're happy as a result. And so the poor in spirit is not taking a vow of poverty. Uh, instead, it's a condition of the heart. There's some that teach that to those that are uh, poor or take a vow of poverty, uh, that, the, that determines one's spirituality. If someone is wealthy or someone uh, has a, a certain house or lives in a certain part of town, whatever else, then they must be unspiritual. Those that uh, don't have much are therefore spiritual. That's not how God defines the poor in spirit. He's talking about a condition of our heart. It has less to do with being monetarily rich or poor. It's more about whether we embrace daily our dependence upon God on a daily basis. If I depend upon God daily throughout the day that's a byproduct of poor in spirit but if I don't depend on God uh, then that shows that what I'm depending on myself I'm proud and I don't understand the high and the loftiness of, of how big and great and awesome God is so the phrase poor in spirit uh, speaks of a spiritual condition of poverty it describes the person who recognizes their desperate need for God do you understand how much you need God oh yeah preach I know much said no do you understand how much you desperately need God uh, do you know how much that uh, your whole life and the revolving of your life desperately depend on God and that uh, we can say oh yeah I know I need God and uh, I need God I'm calling on God to help me they know you are you in desperate utter, utter dismay and start understanding you are in desperate need of God and if God's not involved in your life you're in trouble and you certainly won't enjoy what happiness is there uh, to be embraced by God and so the first beatitude gives to us a foundation for a right relationship with God uh, it's that spiritual condition of poverty which begins with losing hope in yourself and knowing that your only hope is in God and uh, that's hard that's a that's why Paul said I what die daily well, you know why? Because old self rises up off the altar every morning and throughout the day and says, here's what I'll do. Here's what I'll accomplish. Here's what I'm going to do. And it rises up. And God said, listen, if you want to enjoy what happiness is really all about, then you're going to understand what it means to be poor in spirit. And Isaiah says, I was there with the high and lofty one that inhabit eternity. And he says, there of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite. What's he saying? The closer I am to God, the more I realize how awesome God is the more humble the more contrite and the more poor in spirit uh, I become as I stand in the presence of the Almighty God one who is poor in spirit knows they're they are, uh, spiritually bankrupt apart from Jesus Christ uh, one who is poor in spirit uh, means to recognize your true condition before God it's the opposite of being rich in pride and uh, so often we find ourselves rich in pride and uh, not wanting help or not wanting direction or not uh, wanting uh, assistance or, or, or not wanting to, to share the burden of uh, prayer with others. And so we find ourselves rich in pride. And so proud people will never understand what it means to be happy. 
Uh, it's impossible because God says you've got to be poor in spirit. And again, it's not how much money you have or the kind of car you drive or the type of clothes that we wear. God said it's a condition of your heart. Do you have a poor spirit of heart uh, where you realize that without God we're nothing and with God we're everything and we're totally and completely dependent upon God in our parenting, in our, in our marriage, uh, in our finances, in our health, in our everything of life. Everything is desperately dependent on God. And the more I become dependent on God, then the more it makes it available for God to give to me the blessing of happiness. And the happiness is based upon my dependence on God. We'll see that as we build on this thought here tonight. My dependence upon God. Poor in spirit. Luke 18. Take your Bibles if you would and we'll look at that. Uh, it gives us a vivid illustration of, uh, of an example of one who is proud in spirit and one who is poor in spirit. It's a very good observation and uh, example illustration that we can look at. Uh, Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. Look uh, in verse, beginning in verse number, we'll look at just a couple of verses of the story. And so here we have uh, two men that came into the temple to pray. Uh, that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. So two different men came to the house of God. They were going to spend time with God in prayer. Nothing wrong uh, with that. One man, uh, the Bible tells us, was a self-righteous Pharisee. And he felt pretty good about himself. And notice how he prayed. Notice his prayer that he prayed in the, in the temple. Luke 18, verse 11. Verse 11. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. God, I thank thee that I'm not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulter, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. In other words, he's saying, Lord, uh, you're sure lucky that I'm on your team. And uh, Lord, you're sure blessed that, uh, that I'm one of your servants and one of uh, the people that serve you. But notice the other man felt so bad about himself that he wouldn't even come near or look up into heaven. And he felt such a heavy weight of his sin and his unworthiness. In verse 13, he cries out, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And so you've got one man that was rich in pride. And he says, God, I'm glad I'm not like so-and-so. I'm glad I'm not like uh, that person. I'm glad I'm not like that co-worker. And uh, in fact, it's an honor that, I, that you have me to serve with you. And the other one says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Two men in the temple, both men praying. What prayer? Whose prayer do you think God heard? There's one prayer that God heard. And it wasn't the guy saying, I'm glad I'm not an adulterer. I'm glad I'm not an extortioner. It's that one man that recognized his need for God, that saw himself in poor spirit, and says, God, would you be merciful to me, a sinner? Don't give me what I deserve. That's what mercy is all about. These religious people, the religious Pharisee, uh, cried out to God, but God wasn't impressed at all. And so Jesus gave the moral of this story in verse number 14. Look in Luke chapter 18. Look at the moral of this story. The Bible says, For everyone that exalted himself shall be abased. He that humbled himself shall be exalted. And so the moral of the story was, you toot your own horn, you brag on yourself. Uh, that doesn't impress God. God said, listen, you don't know what true happiness is until you have a poorness of spirit. You recognize your desperate need for God. You rep not recognize your bankrupt spiritually before God. You have nothing to offer God. Whatever talents and abilities and skills you have, it's nothing to offer God. We're nothing. We're insignificant. And that's what this one man cried out. God, be merciful fall to me a sinner and God heard his prayer and he says you know what that's a man that's going to enjoy what happiness is all about one man was rich with pride the other was poor in spirit one man thought highly of himself the other recognized his own shortcomings one man was impressed with his own accomplishments the other was depressed uh, by his own sin one man boasted the other man begged one man recommended himself to God the other man pleaded for God's mercy you see a feeling of personal adequacy and self-worth is not necessary to experience happiness. In fact, when you have a feeling of self-worth and importance, you forfeit your right to enjoy true happiness. Well, if I just had this, I'd be happy. If I just had this position, I'd be happy. If I just lived here, I'd be happy. If I just had these relations, I'd be happy. If I just had that, I'd be happy. Listen, your acquisition, your position, your relations does not determine your happiness. It's your 
poor spirit, poverty of spirit. As the Bible talks about in uh, uh, Matthew chapter 5, in verse 3, poor in spirit. Why would those who are humble and without any self-importance find happiness that often eludes the wealthy and the self-confidence? Because those who are poor in spirit have no illusions of pride or self-importance. They don't find their happiness in what they've achieved. They don't find their happiness in what they've accomplished. They don't find their happiness in what trophies or, or uh, certificates are on the wall. Uh, they recognize their personal inadequacy. They recognize their human frailty. They relate to God as dependent beings, looking to God as a source of all things, including happiness. They put their confidence and trust in God, and not in themselves and not in others, and God blesses that trust, and because of that, He blesses them with what? Happiness. Happy is my people who's gone is the Lord. God says, you want to be happy? The more you depend on God, the more you rely upon God, the more you trust in God, the happier true happiness you'll enjoy. The happiest people in this room, the happiest people in our church are those that are the most dependent upon God. There's the one that are the most reliant upon God, the most dependent. God, we need you. Uh, we, we've got to have you involved uh, in our lives. And so the word for poor uh, in this verse is translated from the word that means to crouch or cower like a beggar. Properly bent over, figuratively deeply destitute, completely lacking resources. It's not merely poor, but absolutely in need. In a position where one has no choice but to beg because he cannot feel his, own, feel his need on his own. So he's not just poor, he is in desperate need of someone else to meet his need. He is in that beggarly position. The word spirit uh, is the word spirit, wind, or breath. It's our life forth. It's our sails as we relate to God. And so therefore the poor in spirit means destitute of spirit, begging in humility for spiritual needs to be met. Take your Bibles and go to Romans chapter 3. We use this for soul winning, uh, but uh, let me tie it together a little bit uh, because we recognize that salvation uh, is a part of being poor in spirit. And it's something that we need to continue uh, if we're to enjoy the happiness of God. Uh, Romans 3.23 tells us uh, that we're all in spiritual poverty and that Jesus provides the needs that we all have and he's the only one that can meet that need. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, verse 25, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. And so although we've all sinned and we all need Jesus, most don't recognize their need for Jesus. Broads a way that's going to destruction. And they say, well, everybody needs Jesus. Yeah, everybody does need Jesus, but most don't recognize their need for Jesus. So what happens? They don't get saved. If you don't recognize your need for Jesus, if you don't recognize your sinfulness and lost condition, if you don't bring yourself to a place, what do I always say? There's one thing that costs you uh, if you want to get saved. There's a price that you have to pay. What is it? It's going to cost you your pride. All these years, you've been trusting in your good works. You've been trusting in your church membership. You've been trusting in, you know, your, your volunteering uh, for charity. You've been trying, you got to put aside that pride of what you've been trusting in and humble yourself before God and accept Christ as your Savior. Humility, poorness of spirit is what brings about salvation uh, in a person's life. And so uh, that's what God says. It says because it's a gift, he declares his righteousness for the remission of sins. Aren't you glad, according to verse 25, it's not your righteousness that brings forgiveness of sins, it's his righteousness that brings forgiveness of sins. But it's humbling to admit, I'm not righteous enough to get to heaven. I'm not good enough to get to heaven. Why? All have sinned and all have what? Come short. And you've heard me use the example of the archery and we're using the target there and we're all shooting at the bullseye and you pull back the, the bow and shoot the arrow and one guy misses it by, you know, a few feet. Another guy maybe uh, misses it a few inches. Another guy misses a whole bale of hay. Uh, of all three, the one that missed it by a few inches was the closest than all of them but they still didn't hit the bullseye. The bullseye is perfection. We all come short of perfection. No matter how good you think you are in comparison to someone else, you still miss the mark of perfection. And so God says it's His righteousness, in verse 25, that is done for the remission of sins uh, through the forbearance of God. And we ought to thank God for the long-suffering forbearance of God. And so although we've all sinned, uh, only some have acknowledged that need for Jesus. Those people who recognize that they are dependent on Jesus to meet their need, um, not just for salvation. Now here's the problem. We here tonight that are saved, you understood that. 
You say, you know what? There's nothing I can do to gain salvation. I need Jesus. I'm not good enough. Uh, I can't get dunked enough times. I can't be a good enough person. I can't give enough money. I need Jesus. And you depended solely on Jesus. You took your, your mustard seed of faith, that, that measure of faith that God gave him. You invested in Christ because you needed him. Now, here's the problem. We need him for salvation, and we also need him for the journey of life to follow on. If I'm going to enjoy happiness, just as I needed him for salvation, I need him every step of the way. And that's where we drop the ball because we no longer think that we're spiritually bankrupt uh, and in spiritual poverty. The Bible says, blessed are the poor in spirit. The more we understand how much we have sinned and how there's nothing that we can do on our own, the more we'll admit our necessity and reliance on Jesus. The more we're able to celebrate and be overjoyed at God's grace and mercy. Uh, why was it, uh, listen, why is it that he that uh, forg is forgiven much loveth much? Because he that forgiveth much realizes, wow, God, for, it's like the guy that was forgiven $10, a guy that was forgiven $100, a guy that was forgiven $1,000, a guy that was forgiven $100,000. We're glad that we're forgiven. Praise God. But the one that's been forgiven $100,000 has been forgiven much. What happens? He loves much. Why? He realized how in desperate need he was. There's no way he could pay himself out of that debt. There's no way he could ever get himself above that. But God reached down his mercy and grace and forgave him. And because of forgiveness, that load is lifted of sin and joy out of gratitude for what God's done for him. So the more I realize my sinfulness, the more I realize my need for Jesus, the more I realize what Jesus does for me when he saves me and, lives and blesses me, the more happy I become because I'm no longer under that load of sin. Look at Romans chapter 5. Jump over there. We're in 3 right now. Go to Romans chapter 5. And so the more we're able to celebrate uh, and be overjoyed with God's grace and mercy. Romans 5, 19. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So that's Adam. And so by the obedience of one, that's Jesus, shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. Okay, God established the law not to save us, but to reveal the offenses that are done, to reveal the wrong that's done. So the offense will abound. But where sin abounded, amen, where sin abounded that the law brought a path and revealed the wickedness and the vile and the evilness of our lives, grace did much more abound that as sin, verse 21, hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, so one of the keys to happiness is learning to stop depending upon yourself and start depending upon God. And so the question's asked, are you happy? Are you happy? Uh, are you really happy? And that your happiness will be dependent upon how much you depend upon God versus depend upon yourself. If you depend upon yourself to fix your problems, if you depend upon yourself to, to guide your life, if you depend upon you, uh, then you're not going to be very happy. But when you find your sustenance and strength in Him, uh, you'll find happiness. Do you look at God as a power that can assist you in your goals? Do you look at God as a power that can assist you in your goals? Or do you look at God as a sovereign ruler of overall and how you can assist, assist God in His goals? Is God to help you reach your goal or are you there to help God accomplish His goals? To experience true happiness, recognize that God is greater than anything that you are, anything that you can do, and anything you could ever imagine. Let me give these last few thoughts. I'm done. Go to Psalm 34, Psalm 34, and look at several verses here that we're going to look at in regards to this thing of true happiness as we look upon our dependence upon God. That's what God says. I've got to be poor in spirit. I've got to realize I'm nothing in the presence of God. And it's a very humbling and uh, uh, humiliating place to be as I stand uh, in the presence of an almighty God. And it brings me to a place to understand what true happiness is all about. Psalm 34, and look, look at one verse with me, then we'll look at another one in Psalm 84. Psalm 34 and verse, verse number 8. Psalm 34 and verse, verse number 8. The Bible says, O taste and see that the Lord is good. Notice the word blessed, happy, is a man that trusteth in him. Happy or blessed is a man that trusts in God. And so to the extent that I'm trusting in God. So you're going through some trials right now. You're having a hard time trusting God. You're having a hard time being happy in the midst of the trials. You think the trials is a reason for your unhappiness. 
But the trials is causing you to question God, you're trusting God, and because you're doubting God and not trusting God as you once did, your happiness, your blessedness of God is not evident in your life, and you say, I'm not very happy because I've got this burden in my life. No, that burden is challenging your trust in God. Your trust in God is what gives you happiness. So when you're unhappy, don't look at the problem as a reason for your unhappiness. Look at the focus of your faith as a reason of your unhappiness. Let me give you another verse. Go to Psalm 84 and verse number 12. This is where it all ties together, this thing of blessing of the poor in spirit. Realizing I am nothing. I am nothing. I don't want to be proud in spirit. And I want to be poor in spirit. It's that spiritual bankruptcy that we have before an an amazing God that we serve. Psalm 84, and look in verse verse number 12. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man that trusted in thee. God says there's a blessed person there. There's a happy person right there. Uh, If you're trusting in God, you're happy. You cannot but be happy. Uh, so your happiness is not based upon, true happiness is not based upon your situation, your circumstances, your life, uh, you know, status in life. Your happiness is based upon your dependence, your trust, your reliance upon God. Uh, there's a happiness uh, to be, uh, to have, to be found uh, for an individual who turns to the Lord and puts his trust in him. See, Satan wants to use your problem to cause you to be unhappy because it caused you not to trust God. If God is so loving and kind and trustworthy, why has God brought this into my life? I begin to doubt God. I begin to question God's love and God's goodness and God's care. And when I begin to question God, I'm not trusting God. So I'm now unhappy. I'm unhappy because of this. And if I get a raise, I'd be okay. If I get a promotion, I'd be okay. If I get this taken care of, I'd be okay. If I get out of debt, I'd be okay. No, it's all these events in life that's challenging my trust in God because Satan knows none of these things can rob us of true happiness. But it can cause us to doubt God. And in doubting God, trusting God, we then begin uh, to lose what true happiness is. The more you need God, the more you'll be happy. It's interesting. You can go through some really dark waters in your life. As the Bible talks about the 23rd Psalm, through the valley of the shit, you can go through some hard times And you'll find that God gives you a happiness during those times that's unrelated to anything that's going on in your life other than you're trusting God. There's no way you can, how can you, people ask you, how can you be happy at a time like this? How can you be upbeat at a time like this? How can you be, you know, positive at a time like this? Uh, Humanly, there's no way. But it draws, these events in life, will either draw us close to God or drive us away from God. If they draw us close to God, you'll be happy. God will give you a peace that passeth all understanding. It doesn't make sense. If you allow your problems to drive a wedge between you and God and drift away from God, you'll be very unhappy. You'll blame your unhappiness on the problem that you think is a problem, but it's only a symptom problem. The root problem is you're not trusting God. That's why you're not happy. And uh, look at any area of your life you're unhappy with is because you're having a hard time trusting God in that area. Look at all the areas that you're very happy with. It's areas that you're easy, you're, 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 it's more uh, condu- and, and, uh, conducive of, of your trust in God. The less you need God, the less you'll be happy. You see, I can choose and determine uh, the level of my happiness by my need of God. And so that's why God often says, I want you to need me. Why? I want you happy. And you're not happy until you need me. So I've got to bring challenges and hardships into your life so that you're always in a position to need me because when you need me, you're happy. And God says, why can't you just need me because you realize you need me because you have a poor spirit and it doesn't have to be some event that comes in your life to draw you to a place to say, I need you. And so that's why it's a daily thing. So the secret to living and having happiness is in needing Jesus. Let me give you a couple of verses. I'm done. First Peter chapter 1. I know we went through First Peter in uh, a year or so, but uh, look at this verse here, and, and we looked at it, uh, but maybe not from this perspective. First Peter chapter 1 and verse number 18. Satan does not want you to be happy. Why? Happiness is a wonderful testimony that we can have in a world that's unhappy. 
So what's he do? He brings the events in our life, situation in our life, to cause us to doubt God, to not trust God. And so we think that the problem in my life is why I'm not happy. There's a, there's a relationship challenge. There's, there's, a, there's a glitch here, and there's, there's some worries here. There's a burden I'm carrying. There's hardships I have, and that's why I'm not happy. If I can get this solved and everything is okay, I'll be happy. No, it's a, you're allowing those things to cause you to doubt God. And it's your doubting of God that's causing your, ha- your true happiness to begin to wane, to begin to uh, subside. Look, look in um, 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, look what it says in, in verse uh, number 8. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 8. Whom having not seen, ye love. In whom though now you see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Notice again, you've not seen him, you've not seen God, but you love, you love him. And it says, uh, in whom though you, you see him not yet believing, yet believing, what's that? Trust, you trust God, you don't see what God's doing, you don't understand what God's doing, but you believe in God, your trust is God, and God says what? Your joy is unspeakable, it's full of glory, you're overflowing with happiness, why? Because if you're trusting God, when you doubt God, when you question God, when you doubt if God loves you, when you doubt if God cares for you, then your trust begins to lower, and guess what else goes with that lowering of trust? You lose your happiness. You no longer have true happiness because happiness is tied to believe. I believe God. I trust God. Thereby, God gives me the blessing of happiness. The blessing of that. Now think about your life, and I'm done. Uh, Or more specifically, maybe just about your day. Uh, If you made a list of all the things in your life that makes you happy, I wonder how many things would be on that list. And we could write all the things down, uh, your home, your house, your family, and you just list all the different things. And it's not a, tr- a trick question, just writing all the things down in your life that makes you happy. Now, what if all those things were taken from you, could you still be happy? You made a list of everything that you have in your life that makes you happy. And those are all things to be thankful for. But if all those things are removed from you, are you able to still be happy. Would the day be a good day or a bad day? Would life still be worth living if all that was on your list was taken away? If everything that you said brought happiness to you was gone, would you still be able to live life? While there's a sense in which we're we're made to be happy, the truest and highest form of happiness is always found in God. Long ago, a poisonous seed was placed within the heart of man. And it's grown some roots and it's borne the fruit of dissatisfaction and discontentment and distrust. That seed was a lie that we need something other than God to make us happy. We go all the way back to Genesis. They had everything that they needed to have a happy life. God walked with God in the cool of the day. No better way to have happiness. Why? Because they drew near to God. They depend upon God. But the devil shows up and says, listen, God's holding out on you. Yea, if God said, and that God doesn't want you to be happy, and God doesn't want you to have this, and God and began to question man's heart to trust God, and he began to yield the temptation, and that seed of dissatisfaction, that seed of distrust, that seed of uh, uh, unconcern of God was birth, with birth, in the heart of man and today we live our lives trying to find happiness outside the Lord and you will not find true happiness outside of God because God says happiness is found by being poor in spirit it's having that spiritual bankruptcy of a total need on God I'm not suggesting that there's no happiness apart from Jesus but true happiness the deepest and most satisfying form of happiness cannot be found outside the Lord. Whatever the the world offers, it's temporary. It's not lasting. Uh, It's only for a moment, pleasure of sin for a season, but it disappears. Life changes, but God never changes. That's why Job could say, the Lord gave, the Lord hath taken away, blessed be the name of the Lord. You see, You ought not to be happy because of what what God gives to you in his blessings of gifts. You ought to be happy because of God. Not because God answered your prayer, you're happy, but because you got God. 
Not because God gave you what you wanted, but you got God. And God becomes that source of true happiness in your life. You see, to find true happiness, you must look to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it means when Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Do you want to know what happiness is? The more I depend on God, the happier I become. Why? Because it's not my worry, it's his worry. It's not my burden to bear, it's his burden to bear. The more I depend upon him, the more true happiness I begin to experience in life. Because all that the world has, it doesn't fulfill that void in our hearts. It may give us a little tingle for a while. It may give us a little thrill for a while. It may distract us for a moment. But what God gives is lasting and real. But it must be nurtured. It must be guarded. As the Bible says, abide in me and I in you. And that we've got to always work at God, I need you. And let's not be the type of Christian that only recognize our need for God when we're backed into a corner. Wow, I need God. My life's falling apart. Now, there's nothing wrong with going to God when your life's falling apart and you need God. But if that's the only time you need God, then God's going to have to bring that event into your life more than maybe needful or necessary because God says, I just want to be needed all the time. Why? I want you to be happy. I want you to be happy. So tonight... If you made a list of all the things of what you have in your life to be happy about, could you say like Job, the Lord gave, the Lord taken away, blessed be the name of the Lord. My happiness is not in what God has done for me. My happiness is not in what God gives to me. My happiness is in the Lord. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Father, tonight, forgive us. We're all guilty. We're not nearly as happy as we ought to be. Oh, we can put a smile on our face and uh, we can give the impression that life is going great and we're happy having a time. But according to your word, according to the Bible, happiness is not based upon my status. It's not based upon my circumstances, my uh, things going on the way I want to go. It's based upon you, my trust in you. Because the more I realize how insignificant and nothing that I am in your presence, the more true happiness I begin to enjoy. You want us to be a happy people, but you will not allow us to enjoy true happiness apart from depending upon you. Lord, help us to be a people that are always recognizing our need for you. Not because uh, we're backed in a corner. There's a crisis. There's an urgent 911 in our life. But Lord, help us to daily recognize, Lord, I need you today. As I go to work today, Lord, I need you. As I, as I parent my kids today, Lord, I need you. As I prepare my Sunday school lesson today, Lord, I need you. As I go out soul winning today, Lord, I need you. As I build, go visit my bus kids today, I need you, Lord. Please help me. Or as I try to lead and guide and direct my family, Lord, I need you. I need you, God. I desperately need you. I can't do without you. And uh, like uh, uh, um, was said of old, they said, I don't want to go forward. If you don't go with me, and uh, Lord, I, I want to be able to, to, to be with you and to be right near you, God, because that's where happiness is. I want your approval. If you're approved of how I'm living my life, if you're happy, I'm happy. If you're pleased, then I'm happy. And Lord, my prayer is that all of us would be a people that would be a happy people in the Lord, and not because of uh, a facade we put on the outside, but because of a poor in spirit heart that really realizes, I need God. I need God. I cannot do it without you, God. I can't do it. And Lord, help us to continually remind ourselves of that because that is where true happiness is given and received. Our heads are bowed tonight. Our eyes are closed as we begin this study on how to find happiness. Tonight's message is entitled, From Poverty to Royalty. From Poverty to Royalty. God says, I've got a lot I want to bless you with. It's called happiness. But what can God give me? How about happiness? What's in it for me? How about happiness? There's a lot of folks that have a lot of things that they thought would bring them happiness and they still are unhappy. God says, I got something the world can't offer. It's called real, true, authentic happiness. You want it? God says, it's available to those that depend upon me. The more you grow and your dependence on God, the more happy you'll become. 
Thank you, Father, for this truth. Draw us now with your spirit. Do a work in our hearts. Help us to be a happy people in Jesus' name. Let's all stand tonight.